Hello and welcome to the 23rd Geopolitical Economy Hour, the show that examines the fast-changing political and geopolitical economy of our time. I'm Radhika Desai. And I'm Michael Hudson. And working behind the scenes to bring you this show every fortnight are our host, Ben Norton, our videographer, Paul Graham, and our transcriber, Zach Weiser. 2024 is being billed as the greatest election year in history. More than 50 countries are going to the polls. That's seven out of, the, out of, of its 10 most populous countries with a combined population of 4.2 billion. That is more than half the world's 8 billion population. Among these, for good or ill, one might add the US election will be the most consequential, deciding life and death questions such as how much war the world will witness, how well its economy will do. This is not because the, the US is a force for peace and development. On the contrary, it's been weighing down on the prospects of peace and development for decades. Of course, the formal choices before the US public uh, promise to change little, though a worsening on both fronts is entirely on the cards, no matter which of the two main contenders uh, on the scene at present win the election. But will they even, will either of them win the election? Because there are so many certainties, uncertainties around this election. Will Biden run? Can Trump run? If not they, then who will represent this increasingly divided country? And if no one can, is civil war a possibility that has been canvassed in practically every major news outlet on the cards? And what will civil war in the US mean for the rest of the world? All these questions are part of the, of, of, of the story of the 2024 elections. This, these are the circumstances in which they are being held. Biden's approval rating is only 38%. Indeed, it had dipped into negative territory by August of the first year he took office. And since then, they have only gotten worse. Well, what do the public see that uh, Biden and his supporters are not recognizing? That's really the question that uh, I think we have to talk about today. Exactly. And what is the public seeing and what is the public experiencing to give him these negative ratings? Biden's one hope was to unite the country behind him through good economic stewardship. After all, it was James Carville, Bill Clinton's campaign manager, the guy who helped reshape democratic politics in the aftermath of the Reagan electoral earthquake, who said, it's the economy, stupid. You can't win elections without a good economy. And you can't say Biden hasn't tried. He's even ponied up a new term, Bidenomics. We are told that uh, uh, this is going to solve uh, uh, America, um, the U.S.'s deep-seated economic problems. And certainly his Bidenomics has included considerable sops to the biggest U.S. corporations, the idea being that somehow this is going to induce them to invest, although it is not clear what sort of quid pro quo had actually been set up and nor is it clear that they're actually investing even after receiving these SOPs. The pro-Biden establishment, of course, had, has picked up this term and run with it. They're trying hard to set up an election year narrative that under Biden, the US economy has achieved, has done very well, Bidenomics is working, and it has moreover achieved that miracle of miracles, a soft landing, by which is meant that it has slain the dragon of inflation without inducing a recession. However, their job is not easy and the holes in the story that they're trying to weave together are widening. So Michael and I thought it would be a good time to do a 360 degree check on the US economy. And we want to do it by, uh, by, by going through a number of major topics. We'll talk about employment. We'll talk about the investment situation, the trade situation. The inf this real story about inflation in the U.S. because it's not so clear that the dragon of inflation has been slain. The problem of financial stability and finally, of course, the issue of the budget. So these are the topics we are going to um, to go through. So, uh, but before that, before we go through these topics, we must begin with a contrast. On the one hand, the stock market is soaring. Let me just show you. The, uh, a few of the stock market indices here. Um, 
Um, this is the S&P, so Standard & Poor 500. You can see it is at the highest point it's ever been in its history. This is the Dow Jones Industrial Average, similarly at a peak. And the NASDAQ is, if not at a peak, at a, a peak pretty close to its previous peak. So you can see that all the stock markets are doing really, really well. But Michael, does this mean that the U.S. economy is doing well? Well, it certainly means that there is a tech bubble uh, and a war, bu war industry bubble. Uh, but let's look at all the things that are increasing. Uh, since your chart, not only are stocks going up, but uh, uh, when stocks go up, economic polarization increases uh, because most of the stocks are owned by uh, the top 10% of the population. So economic polarization is increasing as wealth is concentrated at the top of the economic pyramid. And uh, a lot of voters see this as unfair. So uh, to say that the stock market and the 1% uh, are doing well is not really a good political uh, selling point, uh, unless uh, you can convince people that, well, you can be a capitalist in miniature. You can invest your pension funds in the stock market. Uh, you can invest your savings. And maybe you can get uh, uh, rich just like uh, the billionaires. How do you get them to think of themselves not as wage earners, but as stock market investors. If you can convince uh, voters to think that they're uh, finance capitalists instead of uh, wage earners, uh, you've got a good selling point. Uh, but let's look at other things that are up. Crime is up. Shoplifting, uh, robbery, phone and internet uh, scamming. I've already got uh, uh, my uh, morning internet scam call. Rents are up, utilities are pricing, and food outside the home is pricing. I think uh, we'll get to these charts later. Uh, but, yeah, there we go. Basic food, eggs, uh, all of a sudden uh, people are having to pay more, uh, whether they're eating uh, at home uh, or uh, whether they're uh, buying the food at, at the stores, uh, everybody's noticing the uh, prices are rising and the packages are getting more and more empty. Uh, you, you'll get a uh, box of uh, cornflakes and uh, uh, a lot of it is air. Uh, now, so yes, uh, it's Coke called shrinkflation. It's called shrinkflation. Yeah, yeah. So prices go up, and what they sell you, the quantities go down. That's so. right, exactly. Okay, housing uh, is also uh, basically up, uh, and uh, when housing prices are up, you also get homelessness up. Uh, taking the subway in New York, uh, there you'll see a, a very crowded subway car. And then all of a sudden, you'll see cars with hardly anyone in it. And that'll be a homeless person uh, that maybe hasn't uh, had a chance to take a bath for quite a few days. So uh, uh, you're seeing that already. Uh, people are... So, and, uh, and if I may just interject, this is the percentage of households who spend more than 30% of their income on housing. So overall, 30% of all U.S. households are spending more of their housing. But among renters, this ratio goes up to 50%, while among owners, it is 21%. So you can see that those who are wealthy, relatively better off, who own their own homes are penalized less than those who are relatively worse off. And you see here, again, another really shocking statistic. This chart goes back to uh, 1960. And you can see that the house, uh, the ratio of house prices to the median household income went down uh, after the 60s and remained low right into the 1980s. But from, uh, from about 2000 onwards, basically coinciding with the easy money policy of the Federal Reserve, house prices as a proportion of median income has risen. And although they again fell after the 2008 housing bubble burst, they began rising again. And today they are even higher than they were in 2008. But yes, Michael, sorry, I thought I'd just explained these before. So go ahead. <laughs> The situation is actually much worse than that chart uh, says, because uh, not only have housing prices gone up, but the mortgage rates have gone up. They've doubled from about 3% uh, to almost 7%. Now, if you have a mortgage, uh, you want to buy a house. You don't want to be a renter. You want to escape from being a renter. You buy a house, uh, and your mortgage has to be 7%. That means the entire price of the house, the mortgage that you're paying doubles in 10 years. Uh, and if it's a 30 year mortgage, it doubles again and it quadruples in uh, 20 years. 
and multiplies eight times by the end of the 30 year mortgage so that the bank will get eight times as much for the house you buy as the person who sells the house to you. The, uh, the mortgage rate and the debt attached to the house is expanding even more rapidly than the housing prices. That's what debt deflation is. And uh, that's part of uh, why the economy is being malstructured. So what voters are seeing is not simply the economy is getting worse, but the whole way in which it's structuring and the direction it's going in, financialization and the whole neoliberal uh, plan is uh, uh, makes them want to throw the uh, throw the uh, the rascals out of office. Uh, entertainment. And indeed, the the approval ratings figures are showing exactly that. Yes, what they're disapproving of is the economy. Uh, above all, and people say, oh, it's just because Mr. Biden's uh, getting senile. Well, it's not that uh, he's getting senile, it's that he's a nasty, bad person running a nasty, bad economy. That's uh, that's really the key. Exactly. Uh, so, and, and, uh, uh, sorry. Yeah. We haven't even mentioned the medical costs uh, going up uh, for people who uh, are, have lost their jobs or they have to stay home because of COVID. Uh, there, there's a whole COVID uh, effect of the economy. Uh, long COVID is a problem that isn't being uh, counted. A lot of people are having to uh, take part-time jobs. Uh, so wh what you're seeing is uh, a kind of crapification of the economy that uh, you mentioned that about uh, the prices that we're seeing. A whole new vocabulary is being developed to uh, describe what's happening in the economy uh, and shitification, uh, the whole bit. Uh, so let's look at what hasn't increased. Uh, uh, maybe there's a bright spot there. Well, lifespans have not increased uh, and health generally has gone uh, way down. Uh, you have a reversal in the whole post-war rise of lifespans, they've gone down. They've gone down especially for uh, people who earn less than $50,000 a year, for non-white people, uh, they're, they're turning down. Wages uh, have been turning down. Uh, the Financial Times last week had a story that uh, wages are uh, growing more slowly for employers uh, working at home because uh, empl uh, employers want to see them uh, in the office. And yet what they found in Eng uh, your country now, England, is that uh, workers from home, the productivity is going up even faster than uh, um, workers who actually have to go to the office and sit on a long transportation train uh, to get in, whether it's London uh, or New York. So uh, the Financial Times said this is a success story. Uh, employers gain in both ways. Uh, the workers get to stay home and they're more productive, but you're paying them less for the right to stay home. So, and you're uh, not paying for all those offices. We'll come back yeah. to that as well. But yeah. uh, shall we go into our discussion of the various topics now? Sure. Yeah. So our first, the first topic we wanted to discuss was employment. So on the on the employment front, recently, as many of you will have seen, the Biden administration is making much of a report of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which reports that 30, 350,000 new jobs were created in the previous month. However, uh, there are uh, huge problems with that. Uh, first of all, let me just show you the, the story, the official story that the uh, Biden administration would like to, uh, to emphasize. So this is the official unemployment rate uh, that is shown uh, on the Federal Reserve website. And you can see this all chart also goes back to 1950. And you can see that um, uh, there have been various peaks in unemployment in the 1980s and again after 2008. And then unemployment went down. And then, of course, this huge narrow spike is the COVID pandemic, when, of course, it hit nearly 15 percent officially, at least. And since then, it has declined. And so President Biden feels that he can pat himself on the back for bringing down the unemployment rate. However, there are many, many other elements to this story which are not being talked about. First of all, as opposed to the Bureau of Labor Statistics 
coming up with this uh, uh, number of 353,000 new jobs, a private payroll company, which essentially uh, gathers, you know, basically it knows who is paying whom, how much in wages, etc. What is the payroll of different companies reported that only 107,000 private sector jobs were created, which is a very small amount. And even if to this you add the public sector jobs that are created, uh, which will have expanded because of Biden administration initiatives, nevertheless, it um, it you know this would mean that if three hundred and fifty three thousand new jobs were created, then job uh, uh, creation is being led by the government. But at the same time, let's also see something else: full time employment has fallen. That means, and this has of course been historically the issue, the United States always claims that it is such a wonderful job creating economy, but few people point out that bulk of the jobs that are created are part-time jobs. They may even be con zero hours contracts and so on. So we, the, the actual quality, and of course the kind of jobs there are, the benefits are low, the wages are low, etc. So you you essentially have a, an epidemic of make jobs rather than good Good paying jobs. Furthermore, this unemployment rate that I showed you is uh, unemployment rate is always calculated as the number of people who have failed to find work out of a total number, which uh, includes those who are those who are either working or actively seeking work. But it does not include those who have stopped actively seeking work, and that number has actually gone up incredibly, particularly over the, I mean, it has been going up for, uh, sorry, uh, that, that, that number has been going up for a long time, but it has particularly spiked in recent years. So in reality, the, uh, the actual number of American people who are employed uh, 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 as a proportion of uh, uh, the labor force is, is going, uh, sorry, just one second, I want to show you the, the chart. Um, uh, the labor force participation rate was fairly low, just uh, below about 60% in the 50s, because, of course, at that time, most women did not work. But beginning in the 1960s, as women began entering the labor force, the labor force participation rate began to go up and it rose steadily through all those decades up to about 2000, when you see this final little peak here. And since then, it has been in decline. So essentially, what workers are saying is that as neoliberalism has matured, as labor legislation, which decreased the onus on employers and essentially allowed employers to offer workers worse and worse jobs for worse and worse conditions and pay and so on, people who could choose to leave the labor force have been leaving the labor force. Of course, we're not even counting the, the those who become disabled, particularly after COVID and so on. But the, it has been declining. It declined massively during COVID. Since then, it has recovered, but it still remains short of the point it was at when COVID struck. So you can see that this is a, a relatively favorable story that the uh, uh, that the administration is trying to uh, uh, is able to tell entirely because of this uh, matter of labor force participation rates. And finally, a couple of final points: wage growth has been down for a year, particularly as Michael was saying, for work at home employees. Uh, uh, but at the productivity is higher, so employers are gaining. Uh, workers' insecurity is very high, and it is high precisely because they don't have stable, permanent jobs. They have jobs that don't last very long, that are part-time, that, uh, that they hold at the whim of the employer. So the traumatized worker syndrome still remains. Back in the late 1990s, when Alan Greenspan was asked why, if the economy was running so uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 the economy was running so hot, essentially, it was running so well. How come there was not more inflation? And he said it's because of the traumatized worker. Workers are unwilling to demand higher wages, even though, according to, to him, the labor force, you know, the employment rate was very high. But the simple reason was the workers were getting bad jobs. They, they were getting insecure jobs. So they were traumatized and insecure. They were able to complain. Uh, uh, they, they were unable to complain. So 
And, and finally, the quitting rate is very high, partly for medical reasons, but also because hospital workers, teachers, etc., do not feel medically protected at their job. So, and according to the Biden administration, of course, COVID is over. So, so these are some of the problems with this idea that somehow the Biden administration has 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 uh, uh, has given Americans a low unemployment rate. Well, you've made all the points that I would have made, so I don't have to make them. Uh, I would like to see a chart for statistics they don't collect. Uh, the employment by U.S. Multi uh, multinational corporations worldwide, uh, <laughs> their employment in the U.S. may have gone down, but their employment abroad, uh, especially in Asia, uh, the, the Maquiladoras along the uh, Mexican border, uh, th their employment has gone up, uh, but just not employment uh for the, uh, their workers in the United States because it's not really economic to uh, employ American labor given the rise in housing costs that we've just discussed, medical costs and all the other uh, costs that are going up. America has priced labor out of the market except for monopolies, uh, especially artificial intelligence monopolies and military industrial complex. Uh, these are not competitive. Uh, so America uh, doesn't doesn't really have to do anything there. Uh, the, but uh, the, the big point, I think there's a whole, you, you pointed to the structural shift uh, in labor. Uh, um, uh, it's dangerous to go back to the office if uh, they don't have uh, uh, clean air and if you're exposed uh, to COVID and uh, the COVID rates continue to go up and uh, the uh, there's uh, nothing being done to encourage uh, air purifiers or even the use of masks. So uh, you, you've made the points that uh, I, that I would have made. Fine. Um, okay. There's a, a, another couple of points, though. And Michael, I think you wanted to talk about pensions as well. But let me make one point uh, here further, which is that, you know, there's a, a very odd discrepancy in U.S. growth figures that is increasingly being talked about. And that is that there are two measures of uh, 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 GDP. You know, one is GDP, gross domestic product, and the other is GNI, gross national income. And very often, they, these two are basically supposed to match. I mean, there might be some statistical discrepancies. But the first, GDP, which measures essentially how much uh, value was was made out of the production of, of goods and services, and, and the GNI, gross national income, which measures how much people earned out of that process. This discrepancy is essentially being put down to the fact that workers are not buying workers essentially are not you know they're not getting high wages they're not buying enough goods and a lot of their income is actually replaced by debt so that is and the second thing is that in fact a lot of the things that are actually being produced are not in fact being sold so both of these things are also problems and michael you wanted to talk about pensions on the employment yes, that's the problem that uh not only are the workers conditions uh getting poor uh but but pensions uh are uh no longer defined benefit of pensions and many of the pension plans uh, in the United States are actually broke. Uh, uh, again, there was a Financial Times article last week uh, that said that uh, Brooks Masters wrote that the typical Generation X household has just uh, $40,000 saved for retirement and 40% of their 401k uh, pension plans are zero. So uh, this is the result of uh, not having a pay-as-you-go pension policy like Germany has and Europe has. Uh, in, uh, pensions have been financialized. In other words, instead of just paying out of the current economic surplus that you're producing, uh, workers uh, and companies have to pay save up money in advance Instead of investing, uh, the post office, for instance, uh, post office rates, postage prices in America are soaring because uh, the attempt by Congress to privatize the post office means you have to include uh, the pension plans for the next 75 years, all in the price of your postage by saving it in advance not uh, hiring more labor, not improving the mail delivery, but just to turn over to the stock and bond markets uh, to invest so you can pay pensions, if there are any 
uh, postal uh, employees left. And of course, the whole objective in uh, increasing the uh, the public pension plans is to say, oh, I'm sorry, the post office and other public agencies are broke. We've got to privatize them. You privatize them. And uh, what happens is what happened in England under Margaret Thatcher. You wipe out all of the pensions because there's no company to pay them anymore. Now, Peter Drucker called this uh, pension fan, uh, fund socialism before because he said, this is wonderful. Workers and companies are going to pay for stocks and that's going to create financial wealth that's going to be spent on new factories and new, new employment and workers will be capitalists in miniature. They'll, they'll, through the pension plans, they'll be uh, stockholders. Uh, but the effect is simply to divert wage income into the financial markets, into the stock market. The pension system is a bonanza for uh, the, uh, the stock market and for bondholders uh, because it's financializing the economy. Uh, but it's an awful uh, news for uh, the workers who have to pay their own pensions instead of making pensions a public right, like it so, is in uh, socialist economies. Ex exactly. And and if I may add a, a few points to this, you know, this idea that um, uh, that that that, that P the Peter Drucker idea that somehow you will get uh, kind of pension plan socialism. Uh, you know, the, there's a very interesting real life um, uh, 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 example of this. In the 1970s uh, in Sweden, um, and thanks to a, a very high level of coordination between trade unions, governments and employers, what had happened is that they had managed to create a fairly high wage economy, a fairly prosperous working class, a very, very generous welfare state providing a whole range of services. So then the question was, how would workers whose wages will continue to increase thanks to rising productivity, what would be now done with the rising wages? What would they do? So they decided that they would create a wage earner fund. And the wage earner fund would slowly start buying up the stock of existing corporations for which they work and slowly they would eventually become the owners of these companies. And that was the general idea. It was called the Ren Meidner plan. And this plan was much discussed. Everybody thought it was great, but what immediately followed beginning in the 1980s was a major capitalist counteroffensive, an attack on the unions, which essentially meant that this wage earner fund plan was watered down to an extent that it became meaningless. And of course, today, in many ways, people would say that Sweden has gone from a Valhalla of uh, socialism or social democracy to being a Valhalla of neoliberalism. So so I, I did want to say that. The second thing I want to say about- Wait, that uh, Before, that before you, uh, you go on that technical, I want to add uh, a technical twist and that uh, already occurred in the 1970s uh, uh, in Chile under the uh, University of Chicago guidance. Uh, you'll have uh, the Chilean companies uh, found out how to do pension plans the neoliberal way. You do have the workers buy the stock in the company, but the company uh, uh, owner will also have a whole array of companies. They'll have a holding company for the industrial company. They'll have an offshore uh, uh, bank account to hold the stock in the company. And the company will uh, continue uh, to make uh, basically uh, loans to its, its holding company and uh, be loaded down with more and more debt It'll bar, uh, borrow, borrow, uh, and all, and then the uh, holding company, uh, the the actual industrial employer, will be left to go bankrupt. It's a corporate shell, and uh, all the money will have been taken by the holding company. And so, very quickly, uh, Sam Zell, the real estate owner, did this with the Chicago Tribune. The Chicago Tribune uh, had exactly what you're saying. We're going to be part owners. Uh, uh, we reporters and uh, news people. And so Zell uh, uh, bought the Tribune. Uh, then he, uh, he, he said he took all the money in the pension plan, lent it to himself in the holding company, and then said, oh, it's, uh, it's, it's broke and wiped out all of the stockholders. Uh, I discussed that in uh, my, my book, Killing the Host. That's the uh, pension plan uh, finance capitalism.
Exactly. And this is exactly the reason why, as uh, uh, th this is particularly true in the United States, one reads every few months, one reads that some of the other pension plan has essentially lost its money. And that means the workers who had put in their money, their hard earned money into these financialized pension plans, essentially have are getting nothing uh, in, in return. But there's a, a couple more points to be made. First of all, when you financialize pension plans, Workers are encouraged to think that, you know, somehow they are also becoming capitalists, that they have a stake in the stock market, etc. Now, what really happens when our pension money goes into uh, essentially is, becomes privatized and is now being managed by some of the other private financial institution is that our pension money just becomes so much throw weight that they can use in order to move markets in their favor. Remember, when you are speculating, if you are speculating with a few hundred or a few thousand dollars, you are a price taker, a market taker. But when you are speculating with millions of dollars and maybe even billions of dollars worth of money, you are a market maker, you are a price maker, which means that you essentially get to rig the system. So our money is used by these manage fund managers and so on as throw weight in their speculative activity. So this actually increases speculation, it inflates asset bubbles, and it makes financial crisis from which we all suffer as working people more regular, more frequent, and so on. The situation actually gets worse than fund managers. Uh, pension Because the pension plans are in deficit, the pension managers are desperate. How are they going to get more money? They turn the money over to private capital. And private capital is much worse than the pension fund managers. Private capital makes its uh, money by buying a corporation. Exactly. <laughs> and driving it bankrupt. Uh, private capital does to the US economy what it's done to Sears Roebuck, to Toys R Us. Uh, it load, it uh, uh, borrows, uh, the company will borrow a lot of money uh, from a bank. It'll pay a special dividend to the private capital uh, owners. Uh, it will, uh, b the owners will immediately say, we've got to increase earnings. We're going to cut back productivity by when workers leave, we're not going to replace them. We're going to work them harder. Uh, we're going to uh, give the traumatized workers syndrome uh, with, with emphasis. And so by uh, workers thinking, I'm going to be a capitalist, like uh, just like uh, uh, the rich people and my pension fund is going to uh, make money for me as a capitalist, but making money as a finance capitalist means hurting their uh, identity as a wage earner. What are they going to think of themselves as? Well, exactly. And and so, so definitely. And the, the, the other thing as well is that, of course, um, the com the companies that are bought up by are brought into the control of private capital are, you know, these CEOs, etc. They borrow money in order to also, like like Michael said, they certainly borrow money in order to uh, pay huge dividends, but they also borrow money in order to engage in share buybacks, which increases the value of the shares. And all of this is being done on the backs of existing employees. And of course, in doing so, they very often misuse and misapply pension funds so that they can go bust as well. But my second and third point are equally important, which is that Workers who think that they are participating in the stock market and therefore rising stock markets are good for them, etc., should always remember two things. Number one, when markets go up, they may benefit, but they always benefit much less than the people who are controlling these markets, the big financial institutions and so on. They are very low on the pecking order of, ben of benefit of, from financial speculation. And number two, when there is a loss, they lose much more than uh, the, 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 those who are controlling these pension funds, et cetera, who have their golden parachutes and so on. Yep. Yeah, okay, so, so that's about the employment situation. Now let us look at the next point, which is what is happening with investment. So here again, you know, we are being told that uh, parts of the, um, of the US economy are finally doing much better because investment rates are uh, somehow uh, better and so on. But let's look at what's really happening with investment. So this is a chart showing gross fixed capital formation in the United States from 1972 onwards. And you can see that on average, if you drew a trend line in this chart, it would basically be pointing downwards. So basically throughout the neoliberal era, 
investment, which is in many ways the main driver of the economy. Consumption is also important, but uh, investment is essentially, you know, the more there is investment, there is the more growth there will be because investment itself creates growth and it increases productivity and growth. So this has essentially been going down. This peak here is at the end of the 1970s. It's going down. This is about 1990, going up again just with the tech bubble up here and then with uh, uh, the uh, 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 housing and credit bubble, but then essentially declining uh, in after 2008. Since then, it has risen, but as you can see, it remains below, in fact, even many of the low points of the previous 50 years, let alone the high points. So, uh, so, so and, and in the last a couple of years of the Biden administration, these figures are only available to us for now up to 2021. But you can see that um, under, the, under Biden's uh, first year, it effectively took a downturn. And let me also add one other thing, which is that investment as a proportion of GDP, you know, the United States and the Biden administration make much of competing with China and so on. Let's take a look at this graph. It only goes to 2015, but I don't think the story has changed. And this graph, it, by the way, is the work of my partner, my husband and intellectual partner, Alan Freeman. Uh, and here you can see he has given investment as a proportion of GDP for China, which is this bold blue line and for many other countries, but we just want to focus on China and the United States, which is the uh, 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 green line. And indeed, as you can see, the green line is basically at the bottom of all these comparable countries, including Europe, Japan, other industrialized countries, and so on, and even the global south, which is here in this thin blue line. So you can see if you're going to compete with China in terms of growth and, and productivity and so on, China at its peak is spending 45% of its GDP on investment. By contrast, the US is spending less than 20%, less than half in investment. So this is the sorry state of investment in the United States. Oh, it's much worse than that. Uh, it doesn't say... Uh... But uh, how the composition of this investment has shifted, uh, this uh, re, uh, re rising of the US investment is largely uh, military industrial. Uh, a lot of it is also uh, real estate. That's probably the largest element uh, of a lot of this investment. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the real estate uh, investment has been transforming the whole uh, economy. For, uh, and that includes buying out uh, existing companies. That's counted as a, a new investment. If you uh, buy a building that already was at a low price before, uh, it's, uh, buying it at a high price is new investment. In London, for instance, uh, you just had the sale of the British uh, telephone phone tower last week to a hotel company. Uh, so uh, it's privatized. They're going to uh, uh, essentially use that as a new investment, but it's not it's not building a new building. It's just taking something over. In the United States, uh, you had last uh, few months you had Greyhound bus terminals sold. Uh, that was an investment, sort of like Stagecoach in London. Uh, the uh, the company that bought uh, Greyhound is a real estate company. They said we're going to tear down the terminals uh, that are put in the center of the city. The reason they're in the center of the city is so that they'll be convenient for people who ride the bus. They can go to the terminal, have a place to sit, buy tickets. Uh, we're going to make them go to the outskirts of the city and wait outside, regardless of the weather, because we don't care about the the users of our service. We want the, the, the real estate. So we're going to uh, essentially dismantle uh, the public uh, service uh, investment and make a gentrified uh, version out of this. Uh, uh, and in New York, you're having the Wall Street area. Uh, all of these uh, buildings, uh, commercial office buildings uh, in New York, there's a 40% vacancy rate on commercial buildings. So companies are coming in to try to invest the companies saying, well, there's no more industrial economy uh, to put in these buildings. Let's gentrify it for all the people who are getting rich on the financial sector, biz making money, deindustrializing the economy. Well, there's one problem with this uh, that they're, they're suddenly finding out. 
you can take a uh, office building, a bank or a publishing company or whatever, and divide it into uh, residential units. But where are you going to put the kitchens? These buildings are not uh, geared to have gas and electricity uh, and venting for kitchens. And what about bathrooms? Uh, if you look at how your employer is uh, set up at a uh, company, uh, this is not the kind of bathroom that you're going to want near a bedroom uh, or living room for a, uh, a, a residential uh, person. So there, there's an idea that somehow you can, uh, you can do to uh, the commercial uh, office buildings in America what uh, President Obama did to Chicago. Uh, when he was uh, before a president, when his job was tearing down black neighborhoods and getting rid of the uh, low income blacks and gentrifying them for his sponsor, the Pritzkers, uh, to make uh, a real estate fortune there. So fortunes are being made by uh, real estate investment, not exactly industrial investment. Real estate is, again, part of the uh, part of the uh, fire sector, finance, insurance, and real estate. Uh, you're having investment in uh, research and development. That's called uh, capital investment. Uh, I, I, you're get, you're get, getting the picture that the investment that is taking place isn't the kind of investment that originally uh, helped a uh, an industrial economy. It's a deindustrializing form of investment. And and there's also, I mean, in, well, gross fixed capital formation will actually measure uh, physical investment. So that, that there's definitely some physical investment taking place. But as we see, um, it's at much lower than China's. It is not really recovering. And more to the point, if there has been any kind of recovery or whatever little investment is taking place, let's put it that way, whatever little investment in actual plant and machinery is taking place in, under the Biden administration is happening in large part because of the SOPs he's giving to industry via uh, his Infl Inflation Reduction Act and other such initiatives. So uh, essentially, he is giving certain certain corporations money to invest in certain sectors and this is why you are seeing it so it's the dynamo or the dynamic the mojo of american capitalism is definitely not back it is definitely very weak so, uh, you mentioned the inflation and uh th that act uh, uh one of the uh high points of it uh was advertised by taiwan uh taking its uh computer chip company wanting getting i think over uh uh, a vast billions of dollars to set up a computer chip uh, system in Arizona. The people came up here and they say, oh, it's not going to work. There are no workers. Uh, you know, you said that uh, you, you were going to uh, provide us with American labor to work in the investment plant, but there aren't any American workers because they're not trained as working industrially. Uh, you know, who are we supposed to hire as workers for our computer chip plant if you don't have workers trained to work in computer chip plants or other industries. And, you know, that also reminds me, I mean, we haven't even talked about this, but the state of public education, that is the education that most ordinary American kids get, has actually been declining to such an extent, as we know, for decades, you know, teachers will complain that they have that they spend all their time trying to keep control of the classrooms how are they going to teach kids anything so if your kids are not learning what they need to learn how are they going to become even semi-skilled workers let alone skilled workers so absolutely i'm not at all surprised uh, some time ago i remember a reading somewhere that um, the japanese companies that were being uh, encouraged to invest in car plants in the so-called right to work states uh, these companies were having to produce the uh, the literature to to minimally should give instructions to workers using symbols rather than putting it in writing because many of these kids were functionally illiterate but let let's go on because we have uh, quite a few things more to talk about and we don't want to uh, do go too much over an hour so very briefly we said that we would talk about the us trade deficit and once again uh vis-a-vis -vis the trade deficit the biden administration is crowing about its great uh, achievement you see here uh, the us trade deficit which of course historically had been uh, uh, very low. That is, you know, in this graph, the higher the line is, the better the situation. So when the line dips, the deficit grows. So you can see beginning around the 1980s and then really taking off in the 1990s, the U.S. trade deficit uh, uh, was uh, uh, quite, you know, dipped quite low. 
Uh, people were really worried about the so-called twin deficits and, and so on. And then after 2008, precisely because of the massive recession in the United States, the trade situation improved. The trade deficit actually narrowed. And this is also very interesting, you know, historically because of deindustrialization. The United States has a tendency that when the economy grows, the trade deficit grows. Why? Because American consumers prefer buying foreign goods. So uh, uh, this has been the case for many decades in the United States. So obviously with incomes shrinking, so did the trade deficit. But once again, it resumed declining. And as you see here uh, in the Trump years and also in the Biden years, the trade deficit declined. You know, as you see, it, it reached a really, really low point already in the uh, uh, in the uh, uh, in the uh, under the trump administration and it has recovered but it still remains at historic high levels so in that sense if there has been any improvement in the trade deficit uh, again this is largely because of the sickness of the american economy the poverty of american consumers not because of any miracle that the biden administration has uh, uh, has uh, has has executed or or has has brought brought off in the U.S. economy. Uh, there's, I think, the Biden administration has uh, vastly helped uh, the trade deficit. Uh, you know what is Bidenomics? It's it's a slogan for a war economy, financed by a financial bubble. Uh, and the State Department official Victoria Nuland just gave another plea for Congress to give a few hundred, a hundred million dollars for the weapons in Ukraine and Israel. Uh, and uh, since uh, our show focuses on geopolitics, I want to point out how war spending is uh, contributing uh, to uh, the, the the trade uh, balance and also to American affluence uh, against the Europe's NATO countries uh, that America has uh, just conquered economically. Uh, Newland picked up President Biden's uh, point that in uh, in reminding politicians that almost all the money for the war in Ukraine is going to be spent here in the United States, employing labor in the local districts of all the congressmen on the military uh, and uh, national security committees. Uh, that's why war stocks are going up. Uh, and it's uh, the merchants of death uh, business. And uh, Biden is uh, pretending to uh, reindustrialize the economy by emphasizing how this military industrial sector uh, is uh, uh, not subject to price competitiveness. You can do it with low productivity, high cost labor, because uh, it's a, a proprietary good. It's an economic uh, monopoly uh, good for the uh, weapons. Uh, he's, Biden said, quote, but Patriot missiles for air defense batteries made in Arizona, artillery shells manufactured in 12 states across the country, in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Texas, and uh, so much more. Well, these are uh, the swing states uh, in the election. Uh, and uh, you have Biden, Hillary Clinton, Nancy Pelosi, and the other Democrats recognize that the world economy is, uh, is splitting up uh, between the US and NATO, uh, neoliberal uh, countries called democracies uh, and the global majority seeking uh, independence. Well, uh, it's, it's almost as if uh, they're channeling Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, she said the choice is between socialism and barbarism. And Biden and uh, Newland agree, except uh, what uh, uh, socialism is what's occurring in the global majority. Barbarism is what's occurring in the American NATO militarization and the fight in Ukraine and the Near East. Uh, but the uh, fight in Ukraine has helped the U.S. balance of payments, uh, the trade balance, by essentially uh, forcing the NATO countries to impose the sanctions against Russia, Russia that we've talked about. The anti-Russian sanctions have uh, broken the German industrial economy for good. And that's why German companies, uh, Mercedes, Porsche, BASF, are moving to the United States because they can't get uh, the oil and the gas and the energy uh, that's needed to make industrial goods. And uh, what, what's happening as a result? Amer uh, America's not buying uh, uh, European uh, investments. America is replacing uh, Russia as a supplier of uh, gas 
liquefied natural gas, that's way up uh, for the exports. Oil, way up. Uh, um, uh, basically, uh, the uh, America is gaining, uh, and also this hundred million, all this these billions that NATO have given to Ukraine now have emptied out their uh, uh, war stocks, and they now say we have to buy new arms of up to two to three percent of our GDP, uh, and who can make it? America can make it because we don't have any oil and gas you know, to power the industry to make uh, these stocks. This is going to be a huge, huge increase in the American trade balance uh, while the euro goes down and down and down. If I may uh, add, you know, one of the things that uh, that uh, I forgot to mention earlier is that a large part of the improvement in the U.S. trade deficit under Biden and in the last couple of years particularly has come precisely from the export of li liquefied natural gas. So, so think about it. Instead of having some kind of serious industrial policy, the United States is once again an exporter of primary products like natural gas, an exporter of energy. And absolutely, one of the key things about... Two, two, two more quick points. You, you're so right to emphasize that, the, you know, Many people think that NATO exists to defend the West against all, you know, originally against communism and then now against all these vague, you know, dictators and what have you. In reality, the NATO exists so that the U.S. military industrial complex will have an export market because of NATO interoperability con uh, considerations. Essentially, when a country joins NATO, they become a captive market for the American military industrial complex. But there is one final point I'd like to make. You know, many, many uh, decades ago, a couple of decades, maybe two or three decades ago, Madeleine Albright is supposed to have said, what's the point of having such a vast and sophisticated army if you don't get to use it? Because this, she was saying, you know, we should, of course, we should go to war if we want to, etc. I'd like to paraphrase her on this. What's the point of having a $1.5 trillion annually military industrial complex if it actually cannot produce sophisticated weapons today? As far as uh, technological sophistication is concerned, Russia and even China are further ahead of the United States. They can produce things like hypersonic missiles. They can produce techno uh, electronic technology to fight wars that is far superior to anything the United States has. So this is another really interesting point, which is that the United States today can only get customers for its Caudal military industrial complex, which has become incapable of producing anything decent when it essentially uh, makes people join NATO and, and, and essentially uh, convinces the governments of various countries to act against the interests of those countries. Because every country that is being brought into NATO on the premise that its security is going to increase is actually going to have its security decreased First, because, of course, NATO is increasing in security around the world. And second, because in reality, NATO is not capable of defending these countries. It has uh, uh, deficient armies. It has deficient uh, 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 industrial and military production. And it has deficient weapons technology. So for all of these reasons, and the reason why the Russians and the Chinese are able to surpass the United States in terms of military technology is very simple. They are there. They yes, they have also uh, in, in, in military industries, but their military industries and their armies are actually devoted to the defense of the country, not devoted to their own expansion for their own reasons. So that's uh, that's that's another thing that 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 I wanted to 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 mention that this is really in terms of the trade deficit. But we also have uh, uh, three more interrelated things uh, to to discuss, which is. The, what's really happened on inflation, what's really happening to the financial sector and to financial stability, and what's what's really happening to the budget deficit, and how are all these things interacting? So let's take inflation first. What I'd like to say about inflation is the following. We are, uh, you know, throughout the uh, last many months, the story has been that the Federal Reserve has managed to create a soft landing. We have uh, uh, inflation, we have uh, vanquished inflation while not uh, being in recession. Now, Michael and I have already told you how the U.S. economy is doing far less well 
than you might imagine. And that if you look at the GNI statistics, the gross national income statistics, the U.S. economy is in recession. It has had several quarters of declining GNI. On inflation, then, uh, the story that um, we are being told, the official story, is that the Federal Reserve has performed a miracle. It has achieved a soft landing. It has defeated inflation. And the U.S. economy is not in recession. But the reality of it is that if you go by the GNI figures, the gross national income figures, U.S. is in recession in reality. And um, the other problem is that, in fact, it's not it's quite possible that inflation has not been vanquished because the fact is that while the more volatile uh, prices but particularly energy prices have indeed gone down at least they are down for the moment core inflation remains stubbornly high which is why the federal reserve after talking for so many months about reducing interest rates in 2024 is already beginning to postpone the reduction of interest rates so that so so in that sense inflation has not gone away as a problem and this creates massive problems for financial stability to which the widening U.S. budget deficit is making its own contributions, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Let's take a look at financial stability then. The fact of the matter is that uh, we already saw at the beginning of this year that um, uh, the, uh, uh, one second, yes, that um, we had a series of failures of American banks, the Silicon Valley Bank and a few other banks failed, and they failed chiefly because of the way in which the Federal Reserve is trying to deal with the problem of inflation. We've already discussed in the past that the problem of inflation cannot be really resolved by, uh, 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 it cannot be really resolved by raising interest rates. Indeed, one economist, many, uh, Robert Solo, had uh, essentially talked, uh, uh, referred to the uh, uh, raising of interest rates as a means of dealing with uh, inflation as burning a house to roast a pig. I mean, you don't need to do that. You are basically creating a lot of destruction. But nevertheless, uh, the U.S. Federal Reserve started raising interest rates, and this began affecting the financial institutions like Silicon Valley Bank and the other bank banks that went bust that had relied on the continuation of easy monetary policy. So in a certain sense, we are facing the prospect of another financial crisis, which uh, in 2008, also the financial crisis occurred because uh, in the mid 2000s, the Federal Reserve was started raising interest rates once again because the dollar was falling too low because commodity prices were rising. And as they in brought interest rates up to about 5.25%, which is roughly where they are at right now, this was enough to prick the housing and credit bubbles and you got the 2008 North Atlantic financial crisis as a result. The new financial crisis has arguably already begun. It already began with the uh, uh, bank failures earlier in 2023. And now we read headlines like this, bad property debt exceeds reserves at the largest U.S. banks. This is a Financial Times story. Loan provisions have thinned even as regulators highlight risks in commercial real estate markets. So they are showing us these uh, 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 major banks, uh, how many lost reserves they have in relation to loans that have already become delinquent, loans on which payments have already been missed. These are the six largest banks. And except for JP Morgan Chase, which has a ratio higher than 1%, compared to 2022, in 2023, which is this light blue line, practically every bank has less than $1 of reserve for every dollar of its exposure to, uh, uh, to, to, to bad loans in the commercial real estate market. And these sorts of problems are, by the way, not just commercial real estate is just one, but there is also private equity. There are many other asset markets in which trouble is brewing. And this also goes for the... Um, for the market in U.S. Treasuries, because as interest rates go up, uh, 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 the U.S. essentially has to pay a higher rate of interest in order to borrow money on the international market. And what's more, over the last many years, the Treasury market has been sinking. Um, and uh, yeah, 
the Treasury market has been sinking and it has essentially not got enough buyers. As a result, the Federal Reserve has had to step in in order to prop up the Treasury market. But even then, even with all the support the Federal Reserve is going to get, uh, go, is giving, you can see here this up to up to 2023 is the real uh, real figures. And then from here on, these are estimates. And you can see that interest costs as a percentage, so uh, as a percentage of the uh, uh, of the of the uh, 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 of GDP, uh, the interest costs on U.S. debt are going up, and they will contribute to a worsening U.S. budget deficit. So you see here, uh, interest uh, costs have been uh, just a little above one percent for a while, and now they will go up to two and three and four percent, and this is going to brew trouble. So all of this is going to, and 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 finally, uh, 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 this is an interesting story that appeared on, uh, even though the United States uh, 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 budget is in such. Uh, 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 deep doo-doo, basically, you have the United States government spending more and more money on the military-industrial complex. Uh, we are told that it was, we, the official story is, is that it's worth about uh, $750 billion, uh, 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 three quarters of a trillion dollars. But studies show that the actual size of military spending in the United States is about $1.5 trillion dollars. That is a huge sum. The total uh, uh, amount of US GDP itself is about 20 trillion. So you can imagine it's like about seven odd percent of US GDP. So this is the state of the US economy. It's really, uh, and, and, and so we can expect in the near future uh, 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 to hear about a, a finally official admission of the recession the US is in continuing inflation and with continuing inflation the possibility if the federal reserve increases interest rates or maybe even if it does not increase interest rates the possibility of another financial crisis so this is the sort of sort of cauldron of troubles that is already brewing as the us approaches an election year well there are a couple of things uh, let me go over your charts one by uh, one again uh, you sort of went very quickly. Uh, when you showed the chart about the banks being in uh, negative equity, the uh, this is especially the case for small community banks. Uh, about uh, 30 or 40 years ago, they, there began to be small community banks. These are the, the smaller banks, if you notice, are the ones that are in the most trouble because they're the ones that have uh, made uh, loans to local businesses, local landlords, uh, and you already have a, a, one of the uh, big New York City community banks uh, going broke uh, in the last week, uh, just like you had the Valley National Bank uh, go broke before. What these charts show is that the U.S. financial system in general is in negative equity. Now, just think of that. Well, if you have a financial system that's in negative equity, what do you need a financial system for? The whole idea of finance is uh, people are supposed to be abstinent uh, and save rich people and save their money. You remember Karl Marx's uh, quip that uh, the Rothschilds must be the most abstinent uh, family <laughs> in Europe because they have uh, so much money. Well, the fact is that uh, if banks don't supply money to the economy, but they're broke and they get all the money from the government, why don't we just do, this is just what China's doing. Why don't we just say, okay, money is a public utility. We don't Nationalize need, the banks. But if, if, if it's a public utility like China, then it's not going to make uh, this uh, de-industrial uh, uh, real estate kind of uh, property investment. Now let's look at the, the chart again for the interest rates going up in the U.S. economy. Uh, this is uh, overjoyed. Uh, Biden, and especially it makes Obama very, very happy. This is Obama's dream to get rid of, to privatize Social Security. Uh, the government's going to say, we have to balance the budget. The Republicans are going to close down uh, uh, Congress, as they're threatening to do this Friday, by the way, uh, in order to balance the budget, uh, because the market the magic of the marketplace has uh, raised the interest rates. Uh, uh, we uh, Between the higher interest rates and the military charges that you just showed, there really isn't enough money for social spending anymore. Uh, but we can uh, do what Margaret Thatcher did. 
uh, to the English economy. We can privatize Social Security. And now uh, all the money that you had for Social Security is not going to be your money anymore. It'll be, uh, we put it in the hands of the banks that have already driven themselves in the financial sector into negative equity. Now they can take your Social Security and drive it into negative equity. Uh, that really is the uh, uh, the grand plan to privatize, to treat Social Security, uh, uh, Medicare, Medicaid like the post office. It's all going to be privatized. That's the neoliberal plan. Uh, and this is not an accident. This is uh, it, it, it's a feature, not a bug uh, in the economy. And that's uh, basically uh, the direction we're going in, the privatization of uh, uh, of finance instead of uh, the, doing the obvious thing. If finance is now uh, <laughs> broke, why not uh, do it? The government uh, can create the money instead of what it's doing now. The uh, banks are giving the bad loans and uh, uh, basically they're uh, putting uh, their assets with the Federal Reserve and borrowing the money to stay in business. You can be in negative equity forever as long as the Federal Reserve which basically works for the commercial banks as their customers, is creating enough money to subsidize the negative equity for the banks and the financial sector. What they're not doing is subsidizing the negative equity of the, the wage earners, uh, the negative equity as a result of their uh, housing costs, their medical costs. Yeah, absolutely. Two, two things very quickly. And I think we should probably wind down because we are just about a little over an hour here. But um, just two two quick observations that, you know, in the 2008 financial crisis, uh, there were many people who were arguing that, yes, there should be a bailout, but not of the banks that caused the financial crisis in the first place, but of the homeowners who were not necessarily at fault. And, in, and, and, the, and, and, and of course, the economic benefit of bailing out the homeowners would vastly be greater for the good of the American economy than bailing out the, the banks. But of course, a government that is beholden to the big financial institutions was not going to do that. And so it did what it did. It bailed out, bailed out the big banks and not the poor people who lost their homes, who lost their jobs, etc. The second thing is that, you know, I completely agree with you, Michael, that this is what gov uh, neoliberal governments have done for many decades now. They, they essentially... Uh, 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 want to privatize everything in sight. And of course, by creating a crisis of social security and so on, uh, th that's what they generally do. They first run down any institution, whether it's social security or any other publicly owned asset, and then they say it's time to privatize it because that will improve it. But, you know, I wonder, I wonder if there are not even enough people who can buy U.S. Treasury securities, if the market for Treasury securities is not great, if the big financial institutions are already sitting on my, my mountains of negative equity, where are they going to get the money to buy? Where is going to be the market for to buy these assets that the governments are going to privatize? Because in the history of privatization, there have been many privatizations that have had to be called off because there are not enough buyers. And we may very well be in that situation. So, folks, we should probably... Wait, I, I, have to, yes. I have to answer you. Pose the question. I get to answer it. Okay. Uh, the answer is they'll get it from abroad. This is a geopolitical hour, after all. Uh, their, uh, Europe's loss will be America's gain. Uh, uh, what Affluence is, a, floating, is a, a, a flowing in. You could say that since World War II, uh, Europe and uh, uh, America have gained by keeping uh, the prices of raw materials and uh, third, uh, the global South countries low and keeping the prices of their industrial goods uh, very high. Uh, you, What you're seeing today from Europe is, I think, th their way of solving the problem you've just posed. The bright spot is I that think so. getting a, a flow of American of European companies into the United States, relocating here because they can't. Uh, the European economy is collapsing. Uh, you're having a flow of labor uh, and skilled labor uh, from other countries into the United States. Affluence is uh, this kind of flowing in. If you're not producing uh, an economic surplus at home and you want to somehow sustain American living standards and corporate profits, it has to be done externally. 
uh, it has to be done via foreign countries. And that's the geopolitical implications of all this. If America is turning into a deficit, a, a parasitic economy, uh, some other countries have to pay. And that's why there's all of this military spending. You now. know, I, 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 no, I, I would beg to differ, actually, because uh, here's the thing. The geopolitical economy of the North Atlantic financial crisis was roughly like this, that uh, in the process of deregulation of European financial institutions that came along with the launching of the euro, a lot of European financial institutions ended up uh, outside of North, uh, uh, the United States and Britain becoming the main customers of the toxic securities that were being generated in the 2000s as a result of the of the of the uh, of the housing and credit bubbles once that bubble uh, burst once the crash occurred essentially european money left and it has generally stayed away and there as i said this money is not even available to buy uh, to buy us treasury securities if there will if, if if the europeans invest in the united states that they, they will be investing in these uh, in in creating new assets they're not necessarily going to buy up what the american government necessarily wants to privatize and what's more in recent decades uh, recent years i should say china and japan have also been increasingly reluctant to buy treasury securities so all in all all i'm trying to say is that it is not a given that there that these assets that that the old tradition of essentially privatizing things at bargain basement price even at bargain basement prices is necessarily going to work that's all i'm just wanting to raise some questions around it but so all in all michael i think what we've done is we've painted a picture of an extremely precarious situation an extremely dangerous situation in which People are suffering. They are unhappy. They are going to the polls. They are going. To, they are being asked to choose between two candidates, both of whom have failed in, in in signal ways, and there is not any simple way out. And so, uh, uh, as I say, it's going to be a really, really rocky road to the election. Yep. If you have a democracy, you cannot let people have a vote uh, for uh, the other candidate. Uh, uh, that's what, uh, what uh, our uh, democratic hero in Ukraine, Zelensky, says, cancel the elections. Uh, that's what's happening uh, in Israel. Uh, Netanyahu, uh, no, no way of throwing him out. And that's what's happening here. There can't be a third party. Uh, you have to, as long as the Republicans and the Democrats have the same program, uh, just with a different rhetoric, uh, that's uh, the, the new meaning of democracy. Well, I think that you've said that, said it, Michael. So I think with that, we'll say goodbye for now. And we look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. Thank you and goodbye. And please remember to 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 like our show and to share it uh, as to to other interested people and to subscribe to the channel. Thank you very much and goodbye.